one key, you know, when we finally found a spinner who had worked with us, it was uh, one of the largest spinners in the world based in Bangkok, uh, owned by a man named Johnny Young, and a uh, Korean. And uh, years after we asked him, why did you even do talk to us? Why did you do business with us? We were this little company from California and you were, you know, powerhouse in the apparel world. And he uh, thought for a minute and he said, I guess you could just call me a closet environmentalist. Welcome to this month's Life Saves a Planet. This is a series of talks about the issues at the intersection of climate and nature. We are pleased to offer this series nearly every month in partnership with GBH Forum Network. I am Beck Mordini, the Executive Director of Biodiversity for a Livable Climate. Bio for Climate tells the new climate story about the power of healthy ecosystems to regulate the climate and our need to preserve and restore these systems as an essential part of any path towards climate stability. This evening, we are excited to have with us Vincent Stanley of Patagonia to discuss his new book, co-authored with Yvonne Chouinard, The Future of the Responsible Company, What We've Learned from Patagonia's First 50 Years. I'll give a short introduction of Vincent. Vincent has been with Patagonia on and off since its beginning in 1973. For many of those years, he was in key executive roles as a head of sales and marketing. And more informally, he is Patagonia's longtime chief storyteller. And we plan to take advantage of that this evening with some good stories. Vincent helped to develop the Footprint Chronicles, which is the company's interactive website that outlines the social and environmental impacts of its products and the Common Threads Partnership and Patagonia Books. He currently serves as the company's director of Patagonia philosophy, and he's a visiting fellow at the Yale School of Management. Welcome, Vincent. Oh, good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Well, our pleasure. You know, a lot of people are very, we've been very disappointed by greenwashing and the role of business and the destruction of the environment. And I hope tonight that we'll be able to dig a little bit deeper into how it could even be possible that business has a role to play when they seem to be behind so much of the destruction that we see. I like to frame the conversation and start with the quote at the very at the beginning of the book, because I think it gives us a nice uh, insight into what it takes to be a responsible company. It's very short. Says the most important right we have is the right to be responsible by Gerald Amos. Could you tell us a little bit about why that quote is important to Patagonia? Yeah. Um, Gerald is a, a leader of the Haida tribe in uh, Vancouver Island. And um, we're struck by that quote because I think most people view uh, particularly in, in modern life and in modern culture, view responsibility as a kind of burden. So responsibility in some way is the opposite of, of pleasure. And what we like about that quote is that it changes the discussion. It makes responsibility something that is key to human agency. It means that if we have the right to be responsible taken away from us, we lose a very important right and also an important uh, way of being human. When we uh, we worked on an earlier book, you and I, in, in 2012, called The Responsible Company. And at that time, the word sustainability was coming more and more into the fore. And we thought, no, we don't really want to call ourselves sustainable because we know that everything we do at that time, particularly, is uh, taking back more from Mother Nature than we know how to repay. So to use the word sustainable implies that we are 
um, somehow doing better than we actually are. But every every company and every individual can be responsible. You can say, okay, this is uh, this is where where my strengths are. This is where we have done the right thing. This is where we are not doing the right thing, and we don't know yet how to do it. But we own this. We're responsible for. It. And I think I'd like to relate it just to another quote relating to your work on biodiversity. Uh, Aldo Leopold, it was, it's a, it was kind of the foundation of the land ethic. He said, a, a thing is right when it tends to support the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. And a thing is wrong otherwise. But biotic community includes human beings. And I think the key to that quote is that the way we've made our living for the past 200 years and particularly in the last 50, has tended to undermine the integrity, stability, and beauty of, of the biotic community. So where we've come to this current point of a, of a climate crisis, of an attendant social crisis, of a biodiversity crisis that isn't yet fully recognized, it's not just the role of business to really change course and say, we really in order to be responsible, in order to exercise our, our human agency on behalf of our families, on behalf of nature and the earth, we have to uh, find a way to make a living that positively reinforces, that restores or regenerates human communities and nature. And we have to do that in, in business and we have to do that in, in the work in NGOs and we have to do that through work and government. But I've been in business all my life. I've been with Patagonia all my grown-up life. And we're, you can't let us off the hook. Uh, we create, we are responsible for, for most of in the environmental impact through the products we make and the, the services we offer and the transportation we do. So uh, I, I just wanted to say that to give a little context to a discussion about what the role of business is. Because I think we tend to think of business uh, first in economic terms, when in fact we're, we're a, a key social actor. And as a social actor, that's where the reformation has to come. That's a wonderful introduction. And the things I appreciate about it is the humility about not being saying you have the answer, not claiming that, you know, it's all figured out, but that it's, it's a process. And also the importance of having this discussion. Many people think that there's no positive role that business can play. And they also think that there's no positive role that humans can play, right? Mm -hmm. And so a part of the big message of Bio for Climate is how do we as humans play a restorative or regenerative, how do we find our place in nature's cycles and play a positive role in that? And I think you're asking kind of the same questions about business. And those are very important questions to answer. Also, the quote about responsibility says to me something about personal values. That there's not, even though your book contains checklists, that it's not just a series of checklists as to how you get there. There has to be a real commitment and a deep understanding uh, to make these changes and to be that kind of business. Mm -hmm. There's a great story you tell in the in the book. It goes back to 1988 about your Boston story, your Boston store. And even though it's an oldie, I think it's a really good story. And it, and it says something about that quest to learn more about your supply chain and to really act from deep values. Do you, you know the one I'm talking about? Yes, I do. And um, I, I think it was really key to, to the evolution of our company. Um, from just to give you a little bit of background, we were we'd been in business for about fifteen years as a clothing company, and we uh, were very conscious because so many of the early employees were climbers and surfers. We were very conscious of environmental degradation. You know, the climbers who would go back to Kilimanjaro could see that the glaciers had shrunk. The surfers could see their key breaks. Uh, either developed or 
uh, 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 broken apart by uh, by 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 the changes in the weather. People who spent a lot of time outside saw climate change coming before anyone else did, and they saw biodiversity loss as well. But in terms of our, the products we made, we were a company, as we are now, with a very deep supply chain. Uh, in 1988, more clothes were made in the United States than are made now. Now we're down to about 3% of all the clothes sold in the U.S. are domestic, the rest are imported. But we were conscious of what we could, we didn't consider that we controlled our suppliers, but we considered that we controlled our own actions. So when we built a store, we used low VOC paints, we used recycled materials, and felt patted ourselves on the back of it. So we opened up our store in Boston. It was our first store in Boston. And uh, probably the third, I think the third retail store we opened. And did everything right. And after three days, our employees called in sick with uh, stomach aches and headaches. So we closed the store down and we called in an environmental engineer. Uh, he corrected the problem, gave us the bill and we said, well, yes, we thank you. But <laughs> what was what was hurting our employees? What was the agent? That, that caused people to be sick and said, oh, that was uh, formaldehyde off-gassing from the cotton clothes stored in the basement. So this was the first indication we had. I mean, we knew that uh, all of our technical clothes were synthetic polyester nylon. They all came out of an oil well. We were familiar with that. We'd been making climbing equipment for 30 years at that point. We knew the environmental impact of steel and uh, and, and iron and the wood, but we didn't know the that cotton could be create any kind of problem. We thought of it as a natural fiber. And we did further research. Uh, we uh, commissioned a study of the four major fibers we used. And we learned that of wool, nylon, polyester, and cotton, that cotton was actually the worst environmental culprit. And it was the worst environmental culprit, not because of the formaldehyde, which is used as a stabilizer, but because of the intensive use of chemicals to grow cotton. So we started to do some work and some research. And the more we learned, the more distressed we got. And uh, so we made the commitment to, we, we, we looked at this and we said, how can we, what do we do about this? And we learned that organic cotton was still being grown uh, in Texas uh, by a cooperative we still buy from because they lost a family member early to cancer from a suspected spraying. Uh, it was available from China and Turkey. And at the time, it was available in the San Joaquin Valley. So we decided to switch and we uh, from conventional to organic cotton. And other companies, Levi's and Esprit, were doing small programs with organic cotton at that time, but nobody had made, had switched their entire production over. And we thought we were being very clever. We bought almost all of the uh, organic cotton being grown in the San Joaquin Valley. We learned how to do a rain dance, because <laughs> if, if the crop had failed that year, we would have been out of the, out of the shirt business. But we then learned that although we thought we had done our homework, we had really not done enough. Uh, when we bought that cotton from the farmers directly, we broke our connection to the global supply chain. So the farmers had no relationship to spinners who turned the, 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 the fiber into yarn, no relationship to the mills who turned that in, yarn into fabric. And uh, we went to spinners ourselves and they said, oh, we hate this stuff, organic cotton, it's no good. It gums up our machines, we don't want to work with it. And our employees start, started to say, well, listen, you know, I've got to do everything I did last year. I've got to design the clothes, we've got to color the line, we've got to do the specs, show it to the major customers. And um, by the way, since you guys have screwed up, you've, you've got to find an entire new infrastructure for creating cotton sportswear. Um, and not a, you know, we've got to raise our prices $5 on everything we make because organics are more expensive. 
And not a single customer has ever asked us for this. So why are we the martyrs? And what we ended up doing is, you know, we listened to everybody, but we the more we learned, the more we were, we, we really felt that we did not want to be responsible for clothes made with conventional cotton. And I think Ewan at some, at some point said, I can't do it, can't make it work, I'm out of the sportswear business. And that was about a third of the loan. So we ended up taking, we rented buses and took employees 40 at a time to the San Joaquin Valley. And um, the minute that bus, and we took everybody, we took accountants and dare, child care workers and cafe workers and salespeople and production people. And the minute you got into the, the, the valley, you could smell the organophosphates used to prepare the cotton, which were developed as nerve gases for World War II. Um, there were no birds anywhere near the cotton fields. They would avoid them. Um, and if you dug your hand in the dirt, there was no life. Uh, it takes worms five years to come back after you stop spraying. There, were, there was no vegetation. Basically, you had the dirt was uh, held up plants mechanically in place, and you fed that water and fertilizers, and that's that's how the cotton grew. So people came back from those trips. At the end of the day, we'd go to a, an organic field, which didn't smell like a factory, out of the uncontrolled air, air quality, um, that you could dig your hand in the soil and it was alive, um, that you could sit there and have a picnic and not feel that you were uh, on, in, a, in a waste field. And people came back and they all said, this is a, you know, this is a pain, but the, the company's doing the right thing. And I, and I think that was a that was just a bellwether moment for the company. It went over. We we ran these trips over an eighteen month period, but it certainly helped the production and the design teams and the sales teams to really understand why we were doing this to support it. And I think what it meant to us afterward is is after we successfully made that change, we we had to cut about it. Uh, a third of the sportswear loan in the first season. We lost margin, we lost sales the first two years, but then we gained it back. If we considered this as an investment, it would have, we, we considered it a risk, but in, 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 in fact, it turned out to, in retrospect, to be an investment because it built the, the, the company in a way that hadn't been built before. Then I think it gave our employees the sense, okay, we made this work, now let's take on the next project. So, you know, making making limestone based wetsuits or making uh, 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 we, we we figured out an alternative that that's plant based uh, that's not nearly as environmentally destructive. We started to work with uh, you know rather than produce cashmere, which is basically uh, uh, turning Mongolia into our wasteland, we used. Uh, recycled an old cash re reworked cash for sweaters and, and that created an ethos of the company that has built a business model that really is based on those constraints that have now uh, created a uh, the need for innovation that then becomes what we're known for among customers so rather than being a compromise between purpose and profit it's actually the source of our profit is the purpose that we've adopted over the past 25 years. I love that story because it's so much more than a sustainability department, right? You took everybody who was involved in the decision train. And also, I think to me, it was eye-opening to discover how many steps there are in the supply chain. It's not just mm -hmm. like, oh, well, let's just order cotton from somewhere else. Yeah. It affects the spinning, the weaving, and all those different pieces. So it is a huge commitment to make those changes. And I understand you've made changes in other other materials as well. You're known for polar fleece, uh, waterproof jackets, things made with microplastics. I, all those issues have come up in our question, in our Q&A. Uh, are there a few you want to address directly, how you're dealing with other products that you're known for and 
in their environmental impact? Yeah, I mean, I think we've actually there's there's one small story I want to I want to tell because because you re, you referred to um, our discoveries about the supply chain, and it was really we really learned that we didn't know how to make clothes, and when we uh, went through the switch to organic cotton, we really taught ourselves how to make clothes. But w one one key, you know, when we finally found a spinner who had worked with us. It was uh, one of the largest spinners in the world based in Bangkok, uh, uh, owned by a man named Johnny Young, and a uh, Korean. And uh, years after we asked him, why did you even do talk to us? Why did you do business with us? We were this little company from California, and you were, you know, powerhouse in the apparel world. And he uh, thought for a minute and he said, I guess you could just call me a closet environmentalist. And 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 I think all along the way, many things that we've we've started out to do that proved to be difficult. We found partners in the most unlikely places who felt that they had a chance to do the right thing. Environmentally, now the the, the two biggest challenges for us over the past few few years uh, in materials, because materials are responsible for something like ninety over 90% of our environmental impact. And um, one is a uh, is a, a durable water repellent that we put on a lot of products to prevent them. It, well, rainwear is critical to prevent them from being saturated, but we put it on a lot of products to uh, keep them reasonably dry. And the material that we used and the entire outdoor industry uses was really toxic, a C6. Uh, carbon carbon six chain durable water repellent that is now outlawed and uh, uh pfas they, they've been known by several names but it's a key element in, in gore-tex that moving away from that has been a very difficult process but i think we're we're, we're finally there another uh environmental problem that uh, we learned about a few years ago was uh, the fleece that we sort of developed the market for. Um, uh, when you wash it in the washing machine, uh, it it creates microfiber that the uh, its filters can't handle, and most municipal water systems can't handle. So it ends up in the stomach of shorebirds. It ends up in the human bloodstream. We, each of us have about a credit card's worth of plastic in our systems um and we we worked with uh um uh, an ngo in vancouver called ocean Rise on several fronts uh how to how to change the 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 weave or the knit of the fabrics to reduce the problem what quality of uh, fabric will uh reduce the the, the pillage or the release of, of microfibers um OceanWise has worked with municipal water systems to see how they can improve. Because this is come, it's not just fleece; it comes from anything made out of polyester or nylon, which is polyester is the most common fiber used in clothing. And we've also worked; we we tried for years to work with uh, find a washing machine company that would put a filter on. And we uh, we developed a relationship with Samsung that really they were skeptical at first, but uh, they have produced. Uh, both a washing machine and, and a line of washing machines that will filter out uh, microfiber waste, but also a filter that can be used independently. The last problem that we're really facing, because we the other thing we, we were really concerned about is the use of polyester and nylon. Um, we had high recycled content for decades, uh, but we still had a lot of virgin material in order to uh, preserve the performance of the product. And we've now developed 100% recycled polyester and nylon without loss of performance. But then the last step is, it's like you do you do one thing and then you discover something else. So, so we say, okay, we reduced our environmental impact by getting out of the use of virgin oil. But then it turns out that a lot of the mills that create the fabric are fired by coal. So how, how do you then 
what we're doing is starting to work with some of those mills to figure out how they can transition from coal to uh, wind and solar renewables, um, which would make a huge difference. It sounds like you are hitting it on all fronts, going down the supply chain, looking at using alternative materials, not petrochemicals, looking at how things are grown and how they're manufactured. How is a company to figure all these things out? Uh, I know you mentioned you've used the, you know, which models, like if you've used the B Corp model, uh, are there standards and how, how, how do you, how do you set that up? Well, you know, I, I think we've, the interesting thing is that any company, I think is a microcosm of its own industry and its own, and its practices. So, so every company develops a kind of expertise um, about the materials it, it uses and the, and the processes, but, most companies are not going to change it. Most companies are looking for ways to become more efficient. So I, you know, I think that the, the, the fact that we pay attention to everything is a is a is a function of actually uh, being intentional about doing that. The, there are other. I, I think when we started out, there were no models, but. Uh, there were there were other friendly companies, as I mentioned. You know, Levi's and Esprit in the '90s were buying organic cotton and using it as content in their in their clothes without advertising, uh, just to support organic farmers. But the 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 B Corp movement, which is about 15 years old now, is uh, is interesting on several fronts because one the B the, the, for people who are not familiar with it, it's uh, B Corp is uh, short for uh, Benefit Corporation. The Benefit Corporation is also a legal entity that has nothing to do with the, uh, with B Corps. Uh, but it's a group of companies that agree to uh, have an independent assessment of their practices every couple of three years that really looks holistically at all those practices, social and environmental. And that has given us a kind of um, independent look at our own practices and also provided a community of companies, of uh, people who share those values and who are going down the same road. I see there's a couple. In the book, I was surprised to learn how many international standards there are, like Blue Sun, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Better Cotton Initiative, Fair Labor, was another one, one about dyes. Uh, with all, it seems like there are a lot of standards like that that could be applied to business. Is it's a problem that people, businesses don't know what to do or that there's not enough transparency or, um, you know, how, how can, how, why isn't it seem to be working? <laughs> well, I think one of the things, I mean, we, we were helped create the Fair Labor Association, and we were an early customer for Blues, which is labor practice audits. We were an early customer for for Blue Sign, but all of these different audits are are um, specific to a certain part of the operations. Even the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, which we helped start, looks at. Um, sort of everything in the manufacturing process and looks at factories as a whole. But there's just, the, it's a lot of, it, it's a lot of independent auditing. It's hard for companies to figure out, okay, what applies to us? What should we do? The, the, the B Corp model is terrific for companies that are really intentional about wanting to be responsible and about wanting to change their practices. It's not so good for companies that, uh, are less committed and maybe just want to take some steps because you actually have to hit a minimum threshold if uh, acceptable or positive environmental and social practices before you can become a big group. And for large companies, for publicly traded companies, there's a, there are other different standards, ISO and SASB, none are agreed on. And I, and I think part of this is a result, I mean, we've had 700 years of 
<laughs> double entry accounting invented by the monk who was who was the tutor of Leonardo da Vinci, so he wasn't too stupid. Um, and we've only had maybe 30 or 40 years of environmental and social accounting. So we don't have broad agreements. It's very complicated. Uh, when you base measurements on values, as Milton Friedman warned, uh, uh, I don't think he was right, but the, the warning was a, a little bit prescient, that once you, once you start talking about values and not specifically about money, the conversation gets more difficult. And I see. Well, and there were claims when we first started talking about the triple bottom line, which was probably about 20 years ago. Yeah. And business assured us that it was impossible to serve two, ma two masters, much less three, that it had to be either money or people or profit. Now, Patagonia has proven that not to be true, mm -hmm. but there has been a slight green premium to the cost of your production. Mm -hmm. And after hearing the story you told just about cotton, I mean, it's understandable why, plus all the accounting that has to go into tracing transparency. Uh, one of the questions we have, I think, is a good question, is that raise the prices so much that it drives people to even cheaper or worse made uh, products. So we'll just take that off the Q&A and see what you think about that. Um, so clothing is much cheaper than it was 50 years ago. Um, if you look at in inflation. And I think that what we value in, in policy, um, consumer friendly policies is to make things cheaper, to make things more things more available. But what's happened with that in the same 50 years that that's that everything has become so cheap is we no longer do it where anybody can see what we're doing. So all the, the factory towns in the Midwest where the uh, children of the guy who worked on the assembly line or the woman who worked in the, in the cafeteria and the, and, the, and, the, and the manager would play on the same softball team, that went away. Or where you could smell the effluent that came out of the, out of the factory, that went away. So, so the social and environmental impacts uh, manufacturing have become invisible. At the same time, things have become cheaper, and it's been on the environment in 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 places where things have been made. I mean, it, you know, the Pearl River for years was indigo colored because of the uh, jeans factories up, up, up upstream. The the conditions, uh, the la labor. Uh, the, the, the assembly factories have chased labor all over the world for 150 years to, you know, basically find farm girls who wanted to earn a dowry for their marriage who would come into the city and work for almost nothing to sew clothes. That is kind of coming to its end, I think. But what you need to do to change that is to have a a different way of valuing things and say, okay, um, I don't want disposable clothing. I don't care to have a shirt that I'm going to wear on Saturday night <laughs> and maybe two more Saturday nights and then I'm going to throw it away because that's what people do. You're going to have something, you're going to have fewer items that are going to last a very long time and, and you take good care of them. And if you get tired of it, you can resell it. You can give it away, or you can resell it on a on a, on a platform and, and do it fairly easily, so it doesn't become a uh, an obstacle uh, to recirculating the clothes. Um, but that just requires a different kind of ethic and a different kind of a sense of what what's good for the consumer than we've had for the past. 50 or 60 years. It's interesting because you've had a revolution in automobiles. I mean, automobiles used to to last for, you know, 50, 60,000 miles, and now they go for 200,000. Um, uh, and people don't notice that. But when you start talking about clothes or food, which are, uh, especially with food, people start to talk about the expense of organics or 
the expense of, of uh, farm grown as opposed to factory grown food. Well, cheap is a matter of perspective, uh, what I hear you say. And a lot of those costs are what you know economists call externalities. Yeah. Society pays for them. Uh, yeah. They're not put into the price. A lot of people talk about, we have a question about upgrading capitalism. You know, that goes to, as you talked about accounting and how we account for things. Uh, true cost accounting is one of the solutions that people look at so that that would even out, you know, that pricing barrier. You're yeah. already including those costs uh, in your products by not creating those externalities. But as you talk about producing less of things, I wanted to show, why is there a picture on the cover of your book <laughs> of a jacket with patches on it? Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, we made a commitment several years ago to take back anything we've ever made to uh, recycle into something of equal value. And uh, that's very easy to do with underwear and uh, fleece jackets because you just you get them back and you melt down the polyester and you can make you can extrude it into new fiber. But down jackets you can't do that. So what we do is we uh, we make coats of many colors uh, and uh, sell those. They become they they make interesting pieces, uh, and uh, that way you keep them in circulation. Right. So you've talked about reduce, right? You're going to buy yeah. less because they're of higher quality repair yeah. so that you can use it longer or pass it along. And you've talked about the supply chain of having a lo lesser impact on the creation of products themselves. I'd like to ask one more question before I let it go completely to audience questions. Because we are biodiversity for a livable climate, one of the things that we talk about is the whole the biodiversity of a whole ecosystem yeah. and there's never just one thing in the ecosystem that you have to look at and all the pieces work together we have classes our biodiversity deep dives we have one coming up in february where we look at everything from the the fungi and the bacteria in the soil mm. all the way up to the animals that are on the land uh and in our case, we're looking for that impact on regulating climate and weather and heat. Mm -hmm. But I think you also see that, uh, particularly in the story about uh, rice paddies. Yeah. And I would wonder why Patagonia is talking about rice paddies. So maybe you want to mention Patagonia provisions and also uh, what you learned about the growing of rice through that. Well, it's interesting. And I, I, I Patagonia Provisions is a very small food company that we created in uh, 2011. And um, we've learned a lot. Uh, you know, when we when, when we talk at the very beginning of the program about the word responsible versus sustainable, with food, when you actually restore soil to health, you're actually giving back to nature more than you're taking. It, that's something we experienced. We'd never, we'd never felt that in anything we did as a business. And it also interests me because actually, when in the process of regeneration, because you know it takes nature centuries to build any kind of quantity of topsoil, but if you use the proper practices, in addition to not using chemicals, but uh, uh, less tillage, companion planting, crop rotation. You reduce the need for water. You you uh, you create the capacity for the fungi and microbes that we spoke of in order to uh, uh, actually mix up the elements in the soil that, that make it alive. And that's a regenerative process. And what so I think what we finally come to is that if you want to be sustainable, essentially you have to be regenerative. That's what makes things sustainable is to. Uh, uh, allow nature to stay alive or to help it uh, revive. And um, the, uh, the, the, the it's a kind of a complicated story with the with the fish patties. I hope I, I can remember it correctly. But basically the rice farmers in, in uh, California used to burn their fields uh, in order to, uh, at the end of the season, uh, to uh, get rid of the husks. 
And the problem was that that created a great deal of uh, uh, carbon uh, when they burned the fields. So, so California banned that. But then uh, if, you, uh, if you don't burn it, then those husks actually generate a great deal of methane which is a problematic, uh, also problematic gas, and in some ways more dangerous than carbon, though there's less of it. So the idea of putting in fish in the fields is that they eat the husks. And then when the fish die, they actually add nutrients, and that can be used for fish food instead of using anchovies or smelt or uh, uh, a small fish that serve as bait for larger fish that uh, create a, a sort of inequities in the protein chain. You're, you're, you're going one-to-one -one in order to feed a salmon with enough nutrients to produce equal amount of nutrients when you, when you get when you consume the salmon. So this is something that we worked on uh, with Huey Johnson at Trust for Public Land. And uh, it's something we're, we're wor working with still in Patagonia Provisions. There's a fish called the Paku. That is uh, has a, a, a very ugly, wonderful. It has almost like human teeth. It's a cousin to the perennial, but not nearly as mean. And uh, it grows to enormous size, and it produces all these benefits because you can put it in the fields. And, uh, it can it it can uh, uh, start the process. The 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 the. the it, this is the part I'm, I'm hazy on, but there's a relationship between that and the phytoplankton and the zooplankton that actually creates a, a proper balance for, for nature without generating a lot of methane and carbon. Well, I love that. And that was probably something that Jim Laurie and at Bio for Climate could explain to us, um, come to our class one day. Uh, but in it, the ability of nature to deal with methane and to process it, whether it's from rice paddies or from cattle farming. We have several videos and talks with GBH to talk about how you can improve those systems with cattle farming as well to deal with methane. Yeah. But you have to look at the whole system. So that's pretty important. I was looking for the term of that kind of ecology where you have working lands that support not only human needs but other species right. restoration ecology yes restoration ecology all right uh, that well i should have known that <laughs> <laughs> and and that's important because conservation is not just about taking lands out of production but it's how you use the lands uh, that are for production right. and it's also really important for marginal you know because nothing is uh, we have marine protected areas and and you know, 30 by 30 or half earth, those are both extraordinarily important toward uh, restoring the planet to health. But you also have to think about the ecotones, the land around that, and how, 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 do, you, how do you create a kind of gradation back to the urban environment that, that isn't just uh, uh, one polluted farm up against a protected one? Right. Well, I don't. I hope I haven't buried the lead, but there's one very important change that Patagonia made to their ownership structure. Uh, I believe that was just last year. Uh, and just for a little bit of background, in the United States, if you're a, a C Corp, the, the law is very protective of shareholder value and shareholder rights. And a lot of companies that had wanted to take environmental moves were hit with lawsuits saying, well, that is impacting shareholder rights, uh, to their rights to profit. Now, that is for publicly traded companies, and Patagonia has always been privately held, but still, you wanted to do more. So um, why don't you just tell us a little bit about this new, new ownership structure and why it makes a difference? Well, I think it, it goes back to uh, the lessons we learned from provisions that when we when we discovered that we could actually do things that have a positive impact, we looked at the business model for provisions, and it's basically any new product line that we come up with from provisions has to solve a problem in agriculture, or has to uh, solve a problem in, in the food industry. 
So uh, that led to a change in our mission, our purpose statement in 2018. We had a very long uh, build the best product, cause no unnecessary harm, use business to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis that had been our watchword for 30 years. We changed it to we're in business to save our home planet. And then uh, in 2022, we actually changed the structure of the company to match that model, which is that the Chenards, who owned all of the stock of Patagonia, uh, gave it to uh, the Patagonia Purpose Trust, which now owns all the stock, votes, uh, and uh, has the voting rights, and Hold Fast Collective, which is another entity, uh, actually distributes, gets the dividends and distributes it for environmental causes. Then it's a 501 C4, so we're able to do political work as well as um, as well as do land conservation and engage in big conservation projects. Well, not many companies, particularly in the United States, can say that their shareholder is a foundation or a trust. I was surprised, though, that this is not a new model in other areas of the world. Yeah, it's not. I mean, it's been a model in in Europe. Uh, uh, Zeiss, for instance, has been a, uh, owned by a trust since 1889. Uh, Carl's, a lot of Scandinavian uh, companies are, are owned by trusts. And um, to uh, how... The actual purpose of the trust can can be fairly neutral for for a lot of uh, Scandinavian and, and German uh, countries, and in the United States, wh what was uh, verboten until twenty eighteen was you couldn't have the beneficiary of a trust be anybody but a person or a group of people. So when that changed, that really made it possible for us to to uh, change our structure. There, well, I guess I'll leave that quote for the readers. There's a great quote uh, in the book yeah. about what that means for. Do you want to share that quote? I think it's great. Sure. Yeah, we we had a big event. We we were we were very secretive. It took us about two years to figure out the new structure. Then we held a a big event in in Ventura outside with all of the uh, employees present and uh, made the announcement. And there's a there's a wonderful woman uh, who works, who's worked at the company for a long time, sort of keeps the production uh, and, and design parts of the company uh, uh, running. And she's very, also uh, quite forth, forthright. So Cheryl Endo, a veteran employee who's long helped the design department keep operations on track, went up to our CEO Ryan Gellert, this is right after the ceremony, and said, I'm not taking any more of your guff. When Ryan looked puzzled, she added, pointing to a tall jack o lantern nearby, I don't work for you anymore. I work for that tree over there. And um, so should we all. I love that. Well, let's take a few more questions. Uh, here's a a great one about what is Patagonia's involvement with and how do you see a responsible company's involvement with and commitment to indigenous peoples and their ecological stewardship? Well, that's, that's a, that's a key question for biodiversity. Um, and it's a key question for uh, how we restore regenerative practices, because there are a lot of things that indigenous cultures still know. They have local knowledge about uh, uh, the local ecosystem, the ecosystem they belong to. They know when to plant things. They know what the <laughs> they know what belongs there. That we have tended to go away from as we've adopted practices that we, we look at, oh, we can scale this practice, we can adapt it to uh, different parts of the world. So in, in terms of the, the, that's one way, one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is just the importance of the significance of human beings as part of the biotic community. 
And I think a lot of indigenous persons, that's a kind of knowledge that we also have among people who are not part of the indigenous community, but have been local to a place for a long time is something to pay attention to. There's a related question, but not the same question, which is that the victims of environmental injustice are usually people of color, and they are always poor people. You know, we don't build a chemical plant in Louisiana next to townhouses in New Orleans. We build it where people don't have the political voice or the power to stop it. Um, so those are those are related questions, but I don't you know that we should. Pope Francis in the encyclical called La Dato Si in 2015 said, you know, it looks like we have, a, or people talk about it as a poly crisis now, it looks like we have several crises, but he says it's one crisis, we have the social, one with a social face and one with an environmental face. And they're inextricably linked. And he also described Mother Earth as the poorest of the poor. And, you know, I, I, I think that that's that's the perspective we need to adopt to um, not be. Uh, we've created some wonderful things in the last 50 years in terms of the ability to uh, connect globally. And we, we wouldn't be here today with you uh, if we hadn't undertaken those kinds of innovations and improvements. But I think what's been lost a lot is the sense of the local the sense of place, um, the, the the sort of the deepest human connections that become less important than um, than uh, what we regard as our needs for the economy or our needs for uh, uh, for industrial success. Thank you. We have about five more minutes, and we can go a little bit over. I think the two things that I would still like to touch on are the role of the consumer and the role of the employee. Most of us aren't the owners of companies or corporations. So if you're an employee, where is your leverage point or agency? And also on the flip side, mo all of us are consumers. And it's so hard to get past the greenwashing. How, how can we know what kind of companies or products to support uh, best not to buy things, but for the things that we have to buy. Uh, <laughs> so if I don't know if there's a quick answer or just a way to address those two sides of where we're coming from. You know, on the consumer side, I think it's, you, everybody has to do the due do diligence and we all have lives and it's hard to do that due, due diligence. But I mean, that's basically what we've had to do as a company. And, at the company scales, the information wasn't available to us and we had to suss it out. Um, you know, I think everybody in general can, we can all look at our practices, uh, 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 take fewer flights, buy fewer, fewer better things, um, um, look into what we're eating or look into the, to, to, to what we're doing. And um, I think a lot of people do make changes once they do get the information. In terms of employees, it's interesting. I think if you work, people ask, ask me this all the time. And I think if you if you if you work in a company where people do care about these things, they care about the social and the environmental impact of the company's products or practices, um, you can find allies within the company. And you can advocate, this is something Daniel Goleman pointed out a long time ago, you can find allies and you can figure out something to do that's fairly simple. And if you're successful, you get more allies and then you can build on that work within a company. It's tough when, if you don't have the support of top management or you don't have the support of, of the CEO or the, or the shareholders, but on the other hand, there's, you know, the especially for, to make environmental improvements, there's an awful lot of environmental improvements that save money. And um, you can undertake those activities, what Walmart famously 
did a lot of those. And it starts to spill over. People start to see, oh, okay, we did, we do, we did that. It's the right thing to do. We're kind of proud of that, even though we did it mostly to save money. And that starts to affect the stated values and the culture of the company and starts to help bring about change. The Daniel Goleman line that I loved was, um, uh, know your impacts, know what you're doing, uh, favor improvements, and share what you learn. And that three-part mantra, I think, is, is essential to all of us who work in the place. Well, it wasn't fair because I only gave you five minutes, but there are numerous uh, appendixes that have checklists in the book that can help you if you're in a company to kind of, or if you are the owner of a small company. And we didn't get to a question about how can small businesses and local businesses embrace these practices, and particularly because they do have an upfront cost. Um, and we do have a couple of minutes if you want to have any encouragement for our small business owners. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think there's a lot that small businesses can do, partly because you know your business pretty well, you know your customers well. You can, it's easier to figure out what is easier to do and what you can get away with. And also a bit of admonishment, don't, don't use that as an excuse. I remember <laughs> when we were very small at Patagonia, people said, oh, we're too small to do that. We can't, you know, we don't have the bandwidth to do that. And then I remember years later, people starting to say, oh, we're too big to do that. <laughs> so um, I would look at what the, what the problem is, what the question is, what is it something you can do something about? And even if it's something difficult to do, if it teaches you how to do your business better, and if it makes a big improvement for your community, why not go for it? Well, thank you. That is very good advice. There are so many more questions lined up. Uh, and unfortunately, we're just not going to be able to get to them all. I will say that uh, everyone that I've shared the book with has been very impressed by the depth and the breadth of the information. And so if you still have questions and are interested, uh, you can learn so much. It's like, <laughs> it's it's a history, it's uh, stories, it's, it's everything that gives you a perspective to make your own decisions from and also to hold society accountable to. I guess maybe one last question that did come up. I didn't see anything about this in your book, uh, but it is about the regulatory environment. Are there regulations or government actions that would make this whole process easier or more transparent or mm -hmm. for consumers or for business owners? Yeah, I, I don't think anything would make anything easier, but certainly everything could become more transparent. Um, the the climate in the U.S. for uh, for that legislation is is not is not right. But the EU uh, European Union is considering um, quite a um, quite a, a series of laws governing textiles and governing the information about your clothes. I you know I I think everybody has a right to know what's in their clothes. So. Uh, if those laws pass, if that comes comes into being, it's likely to also spill over here because people will be doing that for the European brands will be, do that for the European market, so they might as well do it for the U.S. But I don't think local regulation would be a big deal, and partly because nothing is produced in the U.S. So. I mean, t-shirts and you know, three percent of the clothes, t-shirts, sweatshirts, that sort of thing. Right. So what we buy here would be affected by global yeah. standards elsewhere. And I and looking at Europe often gives us a little bit of insight into what might be coming or what's possible. I saw that the European Union just passed kind of like a right to repair, but a mandatory mm -hmm. two year uh, warranty on goods so that yeah. you can't just make garbage that's going to fall apart. So, yeah, that's great. And yeah. New York has passed a couple of laws um, governing the fashion industry there, or 
they're in the process of, pass, of, of passing those laws they're expected to pass. I guess I will end with a big picture question. All of these little steps we're taking to try to slow down the destruction of the environment. Is it enough? Is it worth it? And uh, a friend of, of mine gives the analogy of we're on a bus, it's heading towards a cliff at 50 miles per an hour, you've slowed it down to 30 miles per an hour, but you're still going to go off the cliff. Are these the kind of changes that are changing direction? Or are they just slowing down uh, an inevitable uh, planetary boundaries mm -hmm. collapse or some mm -hmm. such situation? Well, you know, I, I go back to where, where we started um, with this idea of the right to be responsible. We don't know. We don't know if, if, if the actions that we undertake can actually um, um, reverse the damage. I mean, we, we, we know that we can mitigate. Uh, we know that we can affect the future. And not all the not all that we're doing is just slowing down the bus. We're also figuring out how to do things that in a different way or rediscovering ways to act and which don't keep the bus accelerating from the cliff. Um, so I, I go back to this sense of, of the right to be responsible, which I think is more important than hope. I think uh, I think a lot of people have have commented recently that neither hope nor despair are very helpful attributes because they're both based on a kind of uh, imagination and not a very productive imagination of the way the world is and what its chances are. And what we really want to do is, is to um, recognize the reality, but also uh, uh, take advantage of the part of us that's fully human and uh, do what we can to make changes to save that uh, beautiful biotic community in which we and our families are a part. And on which we depend. Well, thank you very much, Vincent Stanley. Well, thank you. Uh, Thanks, Beth. This is my third conversation with you preparing for this, and every time I enjoy it and learn something new. Uh, so thank you for being with us, and thank you for the book that you and Yvonne have put together. I'm sure it will inspire and guide many people and change the way people think about what's possible with business and be inspired to go beyond Patagonia and uh, make those differences. And last, but of course not least, please visit our website, uh, www.bioforclimate.org, and you'll learn more about the many ways that the Earth's healthy ecosystem <laughs> ecosystems can sequester carbon, cool through water, and mitigate climate instability. Uh, and together we can do as much as we can do. And as Vincent said, we hope it makes enough of a difference. Uh, that's all we can do. All right. Thank you for a great evening. Thank See you, you next month. Take care. Thanks, everybody. For thank you. Time.